Suppose you have two circles, one inside the other. I'm going to colour the outer circle blue and the inner circle red, just to keep track of them, because we're going to be seeing a lot of circles in weird places. Now, place a circle at the closest point between them, just touching the outside of the inner circle and the inside of the outer circle. You can then add more circles, building around the space in between the outer and inner circles, creating a big chain. In most cases, this chain won't join up. There'll be a gap left over, which can't be filled by a single circle. But if we choose the size of the inner circle to be just right, this chain of circles will form a tight ring. Now let's reconstruct the chain, but this time let's take the first circle in the chain and move it over a bit. Will the chain still link up to itself? As long as we don't move the red and blue circles, then the answer is yes. And actually, it doesn't matter where we place the starting circle. The chain will always link up with no gaps. This fact is called Steiner's porism. For any pair of red and blue circles, any chain of circles around them will either always link up to itself or never link up to itself depending on the positions and sizes of the red and blue circles. Steiner's porism means that you can do this really cool animation. If you gradually shift the position of the starting circle in the chain, all the other circles in the chain will stay linked together. For context, Jacob Steiner was a 19th century Swiss mathematician, and a porism is... Uh, an archaic term for a proposition. Part of the reason I'm making this video is because I think animations do a better job at describing Steiner's porism than still images. Normally, when you look it up online, you get images like this, which are left without comment as though this mess of circles somehow illuminates everything. We're going to prove this porism, and we're going to do it using as little algebra and geometry as possible. The proof simply requires some logic, a tiny bit of background knowledge, which I'll fill you in on, and an understanding of how space works. The problem seems really hard because all the circles are different sizes, so let's start by looking at a simpler case, when the two red and blue circles have the same centre. In this case, Steiner's porism clearly holds. It doesn't matter where we place the first circle in the chain, because the whole thing is rotationally symmetric. Whether or not we can construct a chain simply depends on the size of the red circle. Okay, that was easy. Now we just need to generalise this to the asymmetric case. A good way to do that would be to find a transformation of the plane, that is, a function taking points on the plane to other points, which takes the symmetric case to the asymmetric one. What sort of transformation are we looking for? Well, it has to preserve circles, that is, all the points making up a circle must go, under this function, to a bunch of points elsewhere which also make up a circle. That way the outer circle, the inner circle, and all the circles in the chain will remain circles, and not turn into anything weird, like whatever the hell this is. We also want this function to be one-to-one, -one. that is, each input point corresponds to exactly one output point, and vice versa. This stops situations like this from happening, where circles can double up. So, at this point, a mathematician would refer to their general knowledge of functions to find one which is circle-preserving. There's a few options, for instance the circle inversion mapping, or the Mobius transformations. I'm going to look at one specific transformation, which at first will appear rather odd, but just bear with me. It's called the stereographic projection. Rather than taking points on a plane to other points on a plane, it instead maps a sphere onto a plane. It works like this. Position the plane so that it cuts through the middle of the sphere horizontally. For each point on the sphere, draw a straight line, starting from the North Pole, passing through that point on the sphere. Where that line intersects the plane is the stereographic projection of that point. You can also do this in reverse. Start with a point in the plane, draw a line to the North Pole, and where that line cuts the sphere is the inverse stereographic projection of that point. The intersection between the plane and sphere is a circle, and points in the Northern Hemisphere map outside this circle, while points in the Southern Hemisphere map inside it. It turns out that the stereographic projection has both of the important properties we need. It's a one-to-one -one mapping, and circles on the plane correspond to circles on the sphere. Proving this is not simple, but the good thing about mathematics is that it's collaborative, and we can outsource proving the circle-preserving property to other people. I've linked a few proofs in the description if you're interested. Some are algebraic, and some are entirely geometric. But we don't want to map a plane to a sphere. We want to map a plane to a plane. So how does this help us? Well, just watch. Step 1. 
Take the symmetric Steiner chain, the one I've already fully mapped out, and position it on the plane so that the outer circle lines up with the sphere. Step two, use the stereographic projection to map the whole thing onto the sphere. The outer circle stays where it is, and everything else ends up in the southern hemisphere. Step three, roll the sphere a little bit. Step four, use a stereographic projection from the new north pole of the sphere to map everything back onto the plane. And step five, scale and translate the resulting image so the outer circle is back in the same place it was in before. And there you have it. With a few simple transformations, we've gone from the symmetric chain to the asymmetric one. If we skip everything in the middle and go straight from the starting plane to the ending plane, this sort of transformation is called a Mobius transformation. Mobius transformations have their own whole area of study utilizing imaginary numbers. However, I think that rolling the sphere is an easier way to see what's going on underneath. The Mobius transformation on the plane is just a projection of a rotation of the sphere. So does this prove Steiner's porism? Well, the position of the starting circle in the chain, this first white circle, is determined by where we place it in the original symmetric chain. We know in the symmetric case that if we've chosen the blue and red circles correctly, the entire chain will link up to itself with no gaps. It seems obvious to infer from this that the chain will link up to itself after the transformation as well. But how do we know that the transformation doesn't mix everything up, separating the circles in the chain? We need to be very careful with the logic here. The trick that will complete the proof is that this transformation doesn't just preserve circles, it also preserves tangencies. Let's say two circles are tangent to each other before the transformation, meaning they're just touching at a single point. Is it possible that after the transformation, the two circles are separate? Well, let's look at the point where the circles are touching. This point lies on both circles, and since the transformation preserves circles, the point must be on both circles after the transformation. But that's not possible, because the circles have no points in common. So after the transformation, the two circles can't be separate. Can they be intersecting? Well, let's look at all the points that are on both circles. In the final image, there are two of them, but before the transformation, there was only one. That's not possible because the mapping is one to one. Each point in the pre-image corresponds to a single point in the after image and vice versa. So the only possibility is that two circles that are tangent before the transformation must be tangent afterwards. And similarly, we can prove that separate circles must remain separate and intersecting circles must remain intersecting. Now we can prove the porism. Let's take a pair of blue and red circles with the same center, with the red circle just the right size, that we can form this symmetric chain. Let's put in a single white circle to start off the chain, positioned wherever we want it to be. After the transformation, we get something that looks like this. Let's now fill in the rest of the circles in the chain. These two circles are tangent to all three of the starting circles. That means when we apply the transformation, they will map onto circles that are, again, tangent to these three starting circles. And we can see that there's only two possible places that those circles can go. Now we just need to keep filling everything in. Each time we add a circle in the pre-image, its tangencies tell us exactly where it has to go in the after image. Finally, we get to the last circle. In the pre-image, it is tangent to all four circles around it. That means when we apply the transformation to this circle, which preserves tangencies, this circle must still be tangent to the same four circles. That means it must fill the remaining space in the chain with no gaps. And that proves that the chain will link up, no matter where we place the starting circle. So that proves Steiner's porism, or at least it proves it for this specific combination of red and blue circles. We still need to check that this method can construct every single possible pair of inner and outer circles around which we can form a Steiner chain. How much information do we need to construct such a pair? We need to specify three things to uniquely define a pair of red and blue circles. One, the size and position of the outer blue circle. Two, the position of the center of the inner red circle. And three, the number of circles that we want in the chain. I've left out the size of the red circle because we can actually infer that from how many circles there are in the chain. If the red circle is too big, the chain doesn't reach all the way around, we don't have enough circles. And if it's too small, the chain overlaps itself because there's too many circles. So these three specifications are enough to uniquely determine the size of the red circle. That means that in order for our five-step method to reach every Steiner chain, 
we simply need to be able to set these three specifications to any arbitrary values. The size of the blue circle can be chosen by simply scaling the final image, and the number of circles in the chain is chosen right at the start when we construct the symmetric chain. The only thing we need to do now is check that we can arbitrarily choose the position of the red circle. Okay, can we move the red circle in any direction? Yes, we simply roll the sphere in that direction. Easy, right? But there's a catch. How do we know if we can move the red circle far enough? There might be a boundary that we can't get past. Well, let's see what happens as the sphere rotates further and further. Let's look at these two opposite points on the blue circle. As the rotation approaches 90 degrees, one point approaches the south pole, which maps onto the center of the plane. Meanwhile, the opposite point approaches the north pole, and as it does so, its projection gets further and further away, with the north pole itself mapping onto a point infinitely far away. The projection of the blue circle passes through both of these projected points, meaning we can make the blue circle arbitrarily large by rotating the sphere closer and closer to 90 degrees. The red circle, on the other hand, doesn't go anywhere near the North Pole, so it instead approaches a fixed, finite size. Let's look at all of this on the plane. The distance between the blue and red circles approaches a finite length, but at the end of all of this, we need to scale down the outer circle to an appropriate size, and so this finite distance gets scaled down as well. Since we can make the outer circle as large as we want it to be, by rotating the sphere closer and closer to 90 degrees, we can make this distance between the two circles as small as we need it to be after scaling. So yes, we can in fact get the red circle arbitrarily close to the edge of the blue circle. That ensures that this method can reach any Steiner chain, and that proves Steiner's porism, for real this time. Now that we've completed the proof, let's stretch this method to the extremes and see what happens. If we rotate the sphere a full 90 degrees, the blue circle keeps expanding and expanding until it becomes a line, and we get a chain of circles wrapping around the red circle, which all lie against this line. Here's what happens if we gradually change the position of the starting circle in the chain. There's an interesting critical point where one of the circles in the chain also passes through the North Pole and becomes another line parallel to the first one and the remaining circles are smushed between these lines. What if we keep rotating the sphere? Well, then the blue circle flips over so that the red circle is no longer inside it. The chain now goes between the two circles, with one of the circles in the chain enclosing everything. Gradually shifting the position of the starting circle in the chain now results in this pretty trippy animation. This also poses a question, do these weirder cases still count as Steiner chains? And if so, did we really reach every possible Steiner chain in our proof? I'll leave you to ponder this on your own. So what have we learned from this? Well, what we've learned is that if you're careful with all the logic, you can sometimes prove remarkable results without using any algebra. Actually, we didn't even use any geometry either, but rather an understanding of how space works and when two objects can be touching. In that sense, this is a topology proof, I guess? Anyway, what is the purpose of all of this? Does Steiner's porism have any real-world application? Yes, its real-world application is making cool animations. Ah yes, the noble pursuit of neat gifts.